Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. The topic of today's show is the power of writing. Our guests for today's show are Dr. Carmen Smith and Judy Shine Logan. But before we get to our guest, my panel and I would like to read a few fun quips or quotes. And Jan, I'm going to let you start. Well, I know somebody else wrote this, but I really think it was me. <laughs> I wasn't very good at juggling family and my career. I was interested in well, who was coming to my child's birthday party, what my son was writing. I was even thinking about Legos. But Jill Claiborne said this originally. <laughs> right. And Carmen? Um, well, there was once a young man who, in his youth, professed his desire to become a great writer. And when asked to define great, he said, well, I want to write stuff that the whole world will read, stuff that people will react to on a truly emotional level, stuff that will make them scream, cry, howl in pain and anger. Well, now he writes for uh, Microsoft writing error messages. <laughs> I guess he got his wish. He got his wish. <laughs> right. And Judy? And this is Kim Anonymous. A visitor to a certain college paused to admire the new Hemingway Hall that had been built on the campus. Oh, it's a pleasure to see a building named for Ernest Hemingway, he said. Actually, said his guide, it's named for Joshua Hemingway. No relation. The visitor was astonished. Was Joshua Hemingway a writer also? Yes, indeed, said his guide. He wrote a check. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> All right, and mine is, revising a story down to the bare essentials is always a little like murdering children, but it must be done. Stephen King. Uh -huh. All right, if you are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing. Our guests are Dr. Carmen Smith and Judy Shine Logan. The topic of today's show is the power of writing. Our first guest is Dr. Carmen Smith, and Dr. Smith, please tell us who you are, you're about your book, and the inspiration behind it. Well, thank you for having me on the you, show, first of all. Welcome. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Um, I have worked in uh, the trauma, uh, I want to say field, but basically it's child welfare. Uh -huh. So I work with abused and neglected children. I have had 20 plus years at Clark County Family Services where I worked at Child Haven, which is a shelter for abused and neglected children that come there after the trauma has happened and they're about to transition into foster care because they can't go home because of safety issues. Uh -huh. So I was the therapist there. Mm -hmm. So the exercise that I always give people is imagine if you were taken from your home. So you adults out there, imagine if you were taken from your home by somebody you didn't know to go to a place where there were only strangers. You're leaving your friends, your pets, your cell phone, your clothing, everything, yeah. your furniture, everything behind. And you're going to a shelter. And then you're told that you're going to go to a place where you'll have different parents and go to a different school. So I worked in that situation, which is very traumatizing, and I'm not even talking about the abuse that's happened to them, right, yeah. the domestic violence that they're coming from. I'm talking about the systems experience. And so what I did over those 22 years talking to adults and children that have been uh, through trauma is that I try to explain what trauma is and how it affects you the rest of your life mm -hmm. if you don't address it, because most of the time we like to avoid it. Right. And so what happens when we go through trauma is that we come onto this planet full of love, but trauma uh, creates fear and fear creates anger hatred, and it affects every relationship that you have from then on. So I wrote the book, The I Am Solution, which is right now on Amazon.com. It's also on my website, drcarmen.com. It talks about how to change that fear, that trauma-based fear, Mm -hmm. back into love. And it is a process. It's not a, a fast food situation where you just drive through and you're healed. Pick which one you want. Right. right. Yeah. And it's not a pill that you take. Yeah. So it is a process of turning all of that into love. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I'm really happy to share that with you today. All right. Where was the inspiration for the book? Obviously, your work with the Welfare services? Or? Yes, um, my work with children. And so in the book, I do talk about that and with adults, but also my own life, because I was of the delusion that I grew up in a dysfunctional family and that because I grew up and I moved away, I thought that 
I was done, that I didn't hold any residual uh, trauma from that, mm -hmm. I was totally wrong. Do you know that if you hold on to resentment or animosity towards your parents, even though it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, it affects how you choose your mate? It affects how you are on the job. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. it affects what you write on Facebook. <laughs> so yes. uh, it also in my life it is in the book because I had to transform. But first I had to realize that, hey, I, I have some work to do. You know, it's interesting that you should say that, Dr. Smith, because I know someone who was in their 50s, who I've known most of my life, called and was boohooing about the past. Now, this is a person who is very successful in her career, retired from a company, started another company with her new husband, had everything you could want financially, and yet they were holding on to that past. Mm -hmm. They were holding on to that grief. And I actually said to this person, why are you letting this affect your life now? You have everything you could possibly want. You had beautiful children. You have grandchildren. Let it go because it's not doing you any good to hold on to that past. Mm -hmm. That's right. And some people are addicted to the pain because once you've been in that pain for so long, you're just addicted to it. That's what you talk about with your girlfriends. That's what you can blame others for. It's great conversation, yeah. they think. But when you're healed and you're happy, and I'm talking about from within, you have the sense of well-being that no longer, no more of what's going on in the world really affects you internally, that you are in joy, in peace even if the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. This is the love that I'm talking about that we can return to. Now, if you haven't healed those parts of you that are still hurting and you've been avoiding it for years, every single piece of the chaos that's going on in the world is in you. Yeah. And you af it affects you like your daily life. So what I'm saying is you don't have to be that way. Right. That's how trauma shows up. And this is all in your book. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. And yeah. and the good news is, is that you can go through a process and return to love where you are in joy no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give us that to eat the information Internet, again. Yeah. Yes. Well, basically, I have a website called drcarmen.com. On there, you can sign up for my newsletter. Okay. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel where I put on videos that will help you through this process yeah. because we need daily reminders. Yeah. Yeah. And you're on um, Amazon. Amazon.com is where you can get the book. All right. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly. And again, my co-host is Janet Corsi and our guests are Dr. Carmen Smith, um, author of I Am, The I Am Solution. And Judy Shine Logan, author of Shelter Me. The topic of today's show is the power of writing. And Jan? Hey, Judy. Our next guest is Judy Shine Logan. Judy, please tell us about you as an author and your background, and what's the latest book you've been working on? Thank you, Jan, and thank you, James, for You're having welcome. me on the show. You're welcome. And uh, thank you, Dr. Common. Very interesting to hear your perspective on this. Uh, I worked in psych for six years, and I got an MED during that time and did a lot of health promotion classes, um, was the administrative coordinator for the nine units that we had in the hospital, small community hospital. And the only way I could get a catharsis of all the pain and suffering I saw, not so much from the psychological, you know, the, I hate to say everyday psychological things, but the abuse, that was beyond the pale. I mean, if someone burns your child with a cigarette or someone smashes your face and breaks your jaw and then they say, but I love you, there's a disconnect for me. And yeah. I just, I had to write that and get it out. And I think one of the things that Dr. Common just said, which is very, very powerful, is about anger. She's absolutely right. The anger stays with you forever and ever if you don't get intervention. Because as I wrote in my novel, which is called Shelter Me, When Friendship is All That Remains, when anger seeks an acknowledgement and an apology and it gets none, it becomes addicted to its source. Uh -huh. Nobody tells a battered woman or battered children that they have a right to be angry. We adults want to automatically jump in there and fix it. Okay, we'll get you in the shelter. All right, we'll get the kids into another school. Okay, we'll 
I hope the dog doesn't get kicked and murdered by your your partner. But the point is, as uh, Dr. Connor is saying, you do therapy with them, you help them to recognize, yes, this has happened to you. You're not at fault. Even this morning, I wanted to be able to get down to the studio today, but a very good friend of mine, um, I say good friend, but I think she was more or less an acquaintance. She uh, called and said, Judy, can I please come and talk to you? And I said, what's the matter, so-and-so? She said, I have to talk to you. And she was bawling her head off. And she came to my home, and we spent three hours. And she poured out all of this horrible feelings and, and abusive situation in her home and with her kids. And I thought, damn, I never saw that coming. Yeah. I had no idea this woman was in that kind of a relationship. So all I could do was to listen to her, acknowledge that it wasn't her fault, that, yes, her partner's a jerk, and she needs to make some safety plans to be able to take care of herself and her children. Yeah. Now, your book, though, they, but you Shelter Me, is that, but that, that's a, it's a fictional story, but it's based on, Things. It's based on real people, but of course I had to fictionalize it. Mm-hmm. Um, and just so that um, Dr. Common knows a little bit about it, it's about two women in crisis. One is a recently widowed exec- executive's wife, got to get her first job at 55 with no job skills. And the other is a young battered wife and mother who becomes the widow's supervisor. Women on polar opposites, young and old, educated, not educated, working, not working, grief for a a lost good love and grief over a bad love that continues, and especially one that nobody knows is, is a bad love. And eventually these women come to a place of friendship, but it takes a while to get there. The widow is grieving, and she's angry, and she's you know, going through all the waves of grief. And the battered woman is, you know, a poly people pleaser. All yeah. she does is, you know, smile and genuflect to everybody in the world, and she doesn't let anybody in because it's shameful. Right. And eventually they come together and they help each other. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And um, I think that it was a very interesting And I'm so tickled that I did it. I don't know how or why I did it, except that my grandmother was a widow. Um, She was not rich, believe me. She was very poor. And she had to get a a job. She was a scrub woman. She could do nothing else with seven little children. And yet she loved her husband till the day she died at 86. And then I see these young, beautiful women and children coming into the clinic, and they're getting the crap beat out of them when they go home. Why? Some trumped up charge. You didn't make my meal right. You, you're no good in bed. You, you, you're stupid. I can't let my friends see me with you. You stay home. I'm going up. These kinds of, of lines that are given to these people, and they start to believe it. Yeah. They start to believe it. What is your, your, your latest book you're working on? It's going to be called Sanctuary, and it's a, a follow up to the first one. Um, as you said earlier, I had a, a, a few uh, blips in the road trying to get back to my writing, but I'm working on it now, um, and I'm hoping that I can get it done by the end of the year. Okay. Marvelous. Wonderful. Well, last, sorry? We said that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's going to be um, probably as emotional and probably as maybe even a little more violent than the first one was, Ooh. because we know that You know, abusers do not change their stripes. They can be put into counseling. Their behavior can be modified. But until they get their own anger acknowledged and they get some help with that, they're going to remain angry all their lives, just as Dr. Common said. Yes. Do you have anything to add to that, Doug? Well, I was just going to say that um, my mom was a social worker, and uh, I have to give the story about my mother. She was a social worker for 30 years in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. And um, when I was about 14 years old, you know, she was on call, so she had a beeper back then, and uh, in the middle of the night, it could go off, and it was one of her clients, and it was an emergency. So one time... Mm -hmm. She came into my room, it was probably about 11 o'clock at night, and she said, uh, my beeper just went off, I have to go to the hospital, because one of my clients, uh, she got beat up by her husband, and he's in jail, she's in the hospital, and uh, bless his heart. 
And I said, uh-huh. wait a minute, bless his heart. Right. Don't you yeah. mean bless her heart? And yeah. she turned to me and she said, you know, nobody starts out as a kid saying, I want to grow up and beat up the one that I love the most. Yeah. She uh-huh. said, he is not himself. This is not the way God created him to be. And so in order for me to help him, I have to see him the way he was originally created. Uh-huh. And so if I don't, I will see him as an ass. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I can't help him. Right. And she said, it always starts as a blessing. Yeah. And so uh-huh. at 14, I did not understand. I thought my mom was naive. I did not understand <laughs> what she yeah. was saying. Uh, right. and, and, and so I, I just really didn't get it until I was a social worker mm-hmm. in my uh-huh. 40s. Yeah with life experience and having to forgive people and Uh also being in front of parents that had put cigarettes out on their kids. Uh And in Uh order for me to help that dad, Mm -hmm. I needed to see him the way he was created to be because Uh he didn't want to be doing what he was doing, but the anger was driving his behavior and uh-huh. it wasn't him. So if I, I had to see him as already healed before I could even talk to him. So this is a process that happens with me. Well, I would like to say that this is interesting that you're, you're telling that story because the whole topic of the show is how words influence our writing. And uh-huh. obviously those words your mother gave you yes. then when you were 14 has influenced what you've written today. Absolutely. And it's influenced me so much that I've gone to University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I teach a class called Death and Dying there. I'm a guest lecturer. And I talk to social workers, people that are the change agents. And I said, unless you heal that which is within yourself, uh-huh. that you are upset with, that you are angry with, you can never work with some of the most people that need your help. Right. Because you're going to judge them. And when, have you ever been to McDonald's and somebody doesn't want to be there and they're working on the other side of the counter and they don't want to sell hamburgers to you? (laughs) I mean, can you imagine somebody that doesn't like your guts because of what you did and now you got to go to them because you're court ordered? Right, yeah. And they don't even like you? I mean, you have to see that person as already healed in order to work with some of the most damaged and broken people. Yeah. Because you... I absolutely yes. agree, Dr. Simon. I think that's very appropriate for a therapist mm-hmm. to do that. I don't think that that's possible for the victim for a very long time. And I'll tell you why. My husband used to say, if you're standing with your foot on someone's throat and you take it off, don't expect them to be your friend. Yeah. Right. Well, and, it, and I think it discounts the victim's experience when we say, well, God bless him. You know, it's okay. I agree with you. I, I also have a strong faith in, in God and uh, redemption, recovery, but it's going to be a long time before you get the victims to agree with that. Well, you're not actually saying, Dr. Smith, that you're going to mend the marriage. Well, what I'm saying, and and I talk about this in the book, The I Am Solution, is that this is a process. This is not a fast uh, pill solution where um, a person that has grown up in this culture is all of a sudden going to be loving towards themselves or other people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this is a process, but I think that the curriculum for helping people, and it starts with social workers because we're like the front line before they even see a therapist oftentimes, um, but, and also for a therapist, but all of those that are in the helping profession need to see the other person that is coming before them that needs help to see them already as healed. But as soon as we label them, then our perception goes on to them as a batterer and we're not helping them. We're continuing the, this That's behavior right. Counter- and thought of battery. Yeah, go ahead. Counter- Insurance is bad for yes. the um, perpetrator. Yes, absolutely. I think that there is a difference between treating those who are abusers and treating those who are victims of abusers. And I think you're absolutely right. I know therapists for years and years who have worked with uh, battering people, and they work out of prison systems, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't judge. They can't because then they can't help. But I, I hope that your book doesn't 
advocate for the victim to say, yeah, you, you, you beat me up yesterday, but I love you today, because that's only going to keep them stuck. Well, yeah. I have an example for you that I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, when I, I lived in Atlanta, Georgia mm-hmm. for 12 years, and I had a surgery done on my back. And um, the surgeon was there, was talking about he was going up into the mountains of Georgia. I thought he meant he was going up there for the weekend, for vacation. And I said, well, that's nice. I was like, that's great. He, and then he told me, no, on the weekends, I counsel people who are in jail. Mm-hmm. And he told me that the main problem they had that he would go up there and counsel for was that – he dealt with men who were in prison for incest. Mm-hmm. And the thing was is that we don't think about it in our society today, but there are still people in the backwoods of Georgia or wherever that we think, well, that, that can't exist today, and it does. It happens in Las Vegas, Nevada. Well, yeah, but you know. <laughs> right and th- now. <laughs> and these people grow up thinking that yeah. that's okay because mm-hmm. that's the way they grew up, mm-hmm. that incest mm-hmm. was fine. Mm-hmm. And yep. so he would go up there, and he had to convince these men, this is wrong. Mm-hmm. This is not all right. Mm-hmm. This is why you're in jail. Mm-hmm. And I know yep. you don't think you're breaking the law mm-hmm. because this is the way it's been in, in your family, but mm-hmm. you cannot do this. So right. I think that's mm-hmm. kind of the point you're trying to get get across, um, Dr. Smith, is the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to bring it to someone's realization. This may have been in your past, Mm -hmm. but it cannot be in your future. Mm -hmm. You know, this, you need to find a way of dealing with this and understand it's wrong. Right. And sometimes when you talk about love, people think that there's no consequence for behaviors. And I'm not right. saying that <laughs> at all, but I understand our culture can think, oh, well, you love them, and so it's okay what you did to me. And that hasn't come out of my mouth, but that's the assumption right. of what I'm saying. And I just want to clear up the assumptions that uh, divine love, there's also, you can love your child, but still there's a consequence for their behaviors. Right. That's what right. I'm talking about. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Um, sometimes, I- oh, go ahead. No, no. I think definitely I hear what you're saying. I just want to kind of reemphasize the point. My book, hopefully, well, not only hopefully, I've seen it happen more and more and more. Every time people read the book or I go to speak to a, a women and daughters group, uh, that sort of thing, I, more and more women will come up to me privately later or call me later and say, you know, nobody's ever told me it wasn't my fault. Why is this happening? I said, it wasn't your fault. Stay with that. Stay with that. See if you can get into therapy for yourself and get your children safe. And barring that, you can worry about the perpetrator later. Get yourself safe and get yourself out of there if you need to. Yeah, and I... I would encourage you to read my book, Doctor, because people have told me, including uh, a major psychiatrist in the Boston uh, psychiatric um, arena put on the back cover of my book. This book should be read by every professional who works with women and children in battered relationships. Yeah, I think we're talking about two different things, though, in a way, Judy. We're talking yeah. about what you're talking about, but what Dr. Smith's talking about is you can't discard both people. You can't discard the victim and the batterer. You have to address both issues. If right. you don't, you're going to have a society out there to where it's okay for the batterer to continue with what they're doing. So right. you have to come to grips with that person, and you have to yep. make them understand what they're doing is wrong and why it's wrong. Absolutely. That's the I only way you will change things. That doesn't mean they have to get back together. Obviously, I understand what you're saying. But yeah. I think the point here is, is that you can't just discard someone because of what they've done if you want no. society to no. change. Correct. I agree. And I think even out here, like at Safe Nest, which is a, a shelter, um, I volunteered there, went through hours and hours and hours of training, and they had programs for the, it was mostly men, sometimes women, who had been the abusers. And I'm fully for that. What I'm also fully for on the other side of the equation is giving victims their advocacy and making them aware it wasn't your fault. We'll yeah, try and, to get, and I think uh-huh. we all agree on that. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, and I do believe in God. I do believe in in uh, recovery and all of that business. But because it's a two sided equation, 
you know, Dr. Um, Common is, is going to be helpful in working with the props. No, no, no. I I, I'm not saying that I'm helpful with, the, with, the, with that particular population. <laughs> I, work in, uh, I worked in an abuse and neglect uh, shelter where I worked with both. Uh, the, uh, I don't call them victims. I call them survivors, but people that have been through domestic violence situations and uh, uh -huh. the... Uh, husband or wife that is the abuser. In child welfare, um, when you're trying to get uh, parents healthy, uh, there's uh -huh. no division. Yeah, and I think they're both trying to get their child back. Yeah, and I think that's what we have to, we have to think about this as well. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to have sympathy for the victim, but you have to understand that I think you do more harm to the child if you don't address both issues, Correct. because they want to know who their father is. Correct. And so are you going to grow up their whole life saying your father's lousy, he was dizzy, did dizzy? I mean, it, they're going to find out. But the thing is, you don't want to put them down to the point to where now they're starting to hate you because why did you hate dad so much? You have to find a way of helping the father. Correct. Or, and like Judy said, sometimes it's it's the woman who's the abuser. That's right. And you have to find a way of helping both sides right. so that there's not shame for that child growing up. That's right. And and we're trying to uh, uh, heal or the, the trauma. So the trauma happened with, let's talk about just the family dynamics. It happens with three people if there's one child and, and both parents. So you're trying to heal the trauma in a holistic way, not... Uh, piecemealing it like the women are over here and the perp is over here and the child is over here in child welfare it's one big bubble we're dealing with all of it all of them uh -huh. and oftentimes you will resource you know the dad goes here he goes to treatment and then the mom goes over here for treatment and the child has its own therapist at some point child welfare because we're trying to reunite families we have to uh uh, see if that bubble can be put back together. So I think I'm coming from a unique perspective because sometimes people are in the, working in the shelter. Sometimes people are working with uh, perpetrators uh, that are in the uh, their seminars that they go to. Some people are working with the court and they have one perspective. But in child welfare, we're dealing with everybody. And so that's what my mom was teaching me is that do not alienate a person based on their behavior. Because mm -hmm. when you do that, you're perpetuating the trauma. Yeah. You're perpetuating the fear, the hate, the anger. And what we're trying to do as healers, if you're a therapist or a social worker, or a grandmother or a mother, we're mm -hmm. all healers. If you're trying to heal a, a situation, you don't do it by blaming or alienating because what you're doing is encapsulating that trauma. And also, you have to keep in to mind or the, the mindset that you're not talking about one specific rule either. It depends on the extent of the abuse, obviously. Right, uh, correct. You know, because the there are many forms of abuse and many extents to what that abuse you know, went to. Right, and there are most, you'd be amazed at how many uh, abuse situations do not wind up in the criminal justice situation. Uh, that was one of my surprises when I started working in this uh, business. Um, so, uh, and the court will order um, you know, someone to assess whether this family can be put back together because that is their goal. So it, it really forces you, hopefully in a good way, to look at humanity in a different way that you don't throw anybody away. And you also um, need to be the healing catalyst in a situation. And it really does help the the family as a whole. Now, Judy, I think from what your perspective is, is what I'm, and I agree, I agree with everything everyone's saying. Um, there are some times when there is no healing for the family. Absolutely. You know, there's just, just no hope. You can't. But I do agree right. still that doesn't mean the person shouldn't get therapy. I mean, they definitely still need to get the therapy. Right. Even if they're not right. part of that, that right. family unit anymore. Absolutely. Right. Or, unfortunately, they don't get into therapy and they go and kill their wife and kids. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is a, a country. We is, see that every day on the news. There's always something. Absolutely. Going, yeah. And my son is a corrections officer in a maximum security prison in New Hampshire. And you cannot believe how many men are in there for having battered or nearly killed their spouses. Right. Yeah. They have to keep those people separate. And especially if they're a sex offender on their children, they have to keep those people separate. Because the general population will kill them. Well, we're, 
perverse. What we need to do is we need to get back on topic. <laughs> this has been very interesting. But our topic is about how the written word can can influence. And both of you okay. have written books that do exactly that. So last week we talked about what, what it was like collaborating on a book, and this week we're going to focus on the power of the writing and what we do, um, we hope can accomplish that and how, how it inspires others. So it's going to be a group discussion, and as we read this, we'll go through and we'll give examples. In an article by Justin Harmon, he states, if you are a fan of writing, then you already know the power it has. Writing Something powerful has the ability to inspire, motivate, change lives, change minds, and even change history. An example, the, the Bible and the alchemist. Even if writing isn't your thing, you probably understand the importance of it. Writing isn't fun for everyone, but everyone does it, and we all write something. Those who write as a creative tool do so to express their creativity, thoughts, ideas, feelings, and help others learn something, do something, or just to plain old right. So let's talk about that for just a minute. Um, when it says inspire, motivate, change life, change minds, change history, that is exactly what you both are doing. You've written something. Yours is in fictional character, Judy. And yes. Dr. Smith, yours is in reality, dealing with the therapy end of it. Correct. But the fact is you both have written something that hopefully will motivate and change the way people look at things. Right. Yep. That's, That's right. The goal. And yep. you know what? Opening up this topic um, is important because the power of the pen has has so much. It's it's amazing. People can mm -hmm. say one thing. I, I, that's why I don't like text messaging sometimes. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but sometimes you'll text message something, and you can say something like, I don't know if I liked that the other day. But yeah. you could take it like, I don't know if I liked that the other day. I mean, yeah. you know, so, you know, it's all in your perspective. Like, well, why did they say it like that? Mm -hmm. it, well, they mm -hmm. didn't say it like that at all. They just texted you <laughs> that right. message. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. you know, the... There's room for error right. or, or misinterpretation. So the power of the pen is really mighty. And even when we're telling fictional stories, I know I tell stories. Everything I write has a purpose or a meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I write science fiction. I have a science fiction novel getting ready to come out here very soon, I hope. And then, <laughs> you know, I have um, drama pieces. I have the one that's about children. It's a children's book. Yeah. Um, every one of them has a message. And I think that's the important thing when we're writing something, whether it's something based on fact or shaping the way we should think mm -hmm. or something on fiction – we we have a power in our hands here, and it's really important to use it for the right things in the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, when we tell our stories, whether it's mm -hmm. it's science fiction, children's stories, juvenile novels, or whatever, we mm -hmm. need to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, yeah, I I wanted to just piggyback off of what you sure. said. Um, you know, the reason I wrote the book is because. Um, People will say, oh, you were, you were in child welfare for 20-plus years. I recently retired, by the way. Um, they would say, thank you. <laughs> they would say, um, oh, what a stressful uh, business you were in or a stressful career. And I said, well, what was stressful was administration. So not uh -huh. the families that I worked right. with, yeah. but it was administration and trying to convey ideas to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, at a meeting where they were linear thinkers and they weren't as creative as I would have wished, they um, respond better when things are in writing. So that's oh, why yeah. I had to write oh. things down. They, res they respond better when it's in a report form or uh -huh. when they can see a chart or some type of research that you've done. And so right. I was working on this book with the idea of I, I want to communicate all of these things that are in my head that I've been doing for 20 uh -huh. plus years that, uh -huh. you know, I would try to explain and people would be like, uh, yeah, so we still need to get the budget for the legislature. <laughs> but, on you da -da -da. know, well, I think we've all been in situations and I know Jan, you have to at work was you'll be trying to, to convey something to yes. a boss or say, well, I have this idea and they'll say, put it in writing. Right. Yes. There you go. That was <laughs> yep. basically it. Right. And, and yep. it's true because yes. when you have it in front of you and it's in writing, if mm -hmm. you take the time to read it, yeah. you have more time to think and ponder about it. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can bring it up in conversation, but by tomorrow they'll have forgotten about That's it. That's correct. So <laughs> once it's in front of them, 
it, you can't forget it because it's right there for you to yes, read. Yes. And oftentimes you'll read it. I know I do this all the time. Even with novels, we do this. You read a novel. Yes. If you go back and read it a second time, you pick up things you didn't even think about the mm-hmm. first time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Some people are reflective learners. They can't learn by hearing. They want to mull it over. They have to think about it, digest it. I mean, when you tell somebody something, you have to tell them four times. Mm. Yeah. First time they hear you, second time they decode it, third time they process the answer, and fourth time they'll come back and, you know, say, oh, all right, I get what you mean. That's me. But we don't always get four times. <laughs> That's me. True. Right? All so, right. Sure. Some people need that written word to be able to process. Right. Mm-hmm. All right, Carmen. And okay. I think writing is so powerful. Yeah. And I just thank the Almighty that I've been given a gift, and I'm, I'm going to use it to, um, you know, to uh, move in ways that I feel moved. And um, I think Dr. Common is doing the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not at odds with Dr. Common at all. I just think we're taking two different approaches, and that's fine. But there are always people who are going to need either or both of those approaches, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do what you're doing or what you did. Mm -hmm. Um, I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. But I can write, and I can portray people's sides. And maybe I'll... I think that's true of everyone in life. I probably couldn't have done what you've done. I, I know I couldn't do what Dr. Smith's done. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then I think that's true. You know, people would look at what I did for a living, even though it was in the food industry, and they'd say, I wouldn't want to do what you've done. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. So I think we yeah. can look at each other. And it, that's what makes us unique and special is that we have those special gifts. Right. And, right. Carmen, I'm going to let you take the okay. next one here. Um, so the end process is the world changer. So we come to the end. The truth is there is no end. Right. To make a change is to keep making changes. To change the world will forever be a never-ending process. By doing what we love and following our passions, we are opening a door. The door we open as a writer is a door to unlimited possibilities and showing others that those possibilities exist. If I Mm -hmm. write about the things that I am most passionate about or someone else writes about what their passions are, we are changing the world. Right. We are opening the eyes for everyone to see things in a different way. And that's exactly what you were saying. Yeah, that yeah. is exactly yeah. what I was saying, you yeah. know. It, exactly. Yeah. And by doing what we love and showing others how to do the same, mm-hmm. you are starting a chain reaction for people everywhere. For instance, in the movie Rocky Four, after he wins the big fight against Drago, his character says, if I can change and you can change, everybody can change. That was an aha moment for many people watching the screen. Think about how profound that statement is and how the writer of that script had the power to make everyone watching perhaps change their way of thinking about themselves and even the world. I think that's so important that, you know, and I don't know how many times you've gone to a movie and you think, well, you know, this is so-and-so, and and there's always going to be a scene in that it's going to move you in some way, either make you laugh or make you cry. And even when you say that I am not going to cry in this movie, you do anyway. So, you know, that's the power of the written word. And even though an actor's portraying it, you see it. And even when you read books, we've talked about this on the show. In fact, we talked about it last show, Jan, where, you know, I've helped on books to where I'm writing the book and I'm boohooing over a part of this book that I came across that I have to help write because, you know, it was a memoir. And that is the power of writing. I mean, it really can move you. And it also makes you open your mind and think about it, Mm -hmm. you know. Right. And I I love the last sentence that um, the doctor just read. We are opening the eyes for everyone to see things in a different different way. She has her audience. I have my audience. That's great. We can couple that together and get everybody involved. My goal is to open people's eyes to say abuse is real. It's wrong. There are multiple layers that go on to generation after generation after generation. But we have to make sure that they know they're not at fault. That's the trap. Well, that's I- plug in the sink. That's what makes the sink overflow. If we can pull that plug out and say, it's not your fault. For well, whatever combination of reasons it's happened to you, you're not at fault. Let's take care of you. Okay, I think we're also, Judy, just so you understand, and, and I know we're all about the same age or close to it. Um, yeah. 
we grew up in a generation that's different than than the newer generation, and you didn't mm-hmm. talk about things. You didn't talk right. about abuse. Um, right. You you know you didn't bring shame on the family. So right. far too often, you know, domestic abuse took place in the household was never reported because you just didn't do that. And so I think that's another thing we're talking about here in that in in people coming forward and talking and saying the word again. You're seeing uh-huh. that change now. You know, we are fighting against it every day. And really, that's what it is. It's a fight against abuse when someone uh-huh. speaks out about it. So, right. you know, we, we are in a different generation. And I think that's one of the reasons why, and I think that's what Dr. Smith alludes to, is that, you know, if you, don't, if you just dealt with just the abused person, then you're not changing anything. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's great. Because you're never going to change her or his script. Right. Unless you, you know, say, look, you're not at fault, let's fix this. And then you try to fix the preparators, uh, the person guilty, um, so that they don't do it to someone else. Okay. Absolutely. All right, right, Jen. Uh, But the thing is, women have always blamed themselves and still do. And I'll just give one quick little scenario, if I may. All right. My sister a retired deputy sheriff from Florida. She got called to a house for domestic violence in maybe the 80s. She went there, the woman's face was mush. And she said, please, let me arrest your husband, right out of a complaint. The woman says, I can't, I can't. My sister said, why? She said, because he'll get mad at me. My sister said, what do you think he is now? She says, oh, no, 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 I, I just burned the up. He'll be fine. The guy comes back, there was a gun in the house. Boom, one of them's dead. My sister had to go back and arrest the wife because they wrestled for the gun, and he got killed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. And Jen? She still thought it was her fault. Right. Well, and uh, and, and that, unfortunately, is the way it, it is in a lot of cases. And at my particular book, I try to see the other side of the pancake. Like the uh-huh. bad guy had to have a reason to be a bad guy. And I, uh-huh. think, I think Dr. Smith is also alluding to that fact. But yeah. this is how writing can change the world. One word, one message, one voice at a time. And we can help yeah. each other. Together, anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to make a few points here, and we'll talk about that. All right, find out what you are passionate about. And I think when you're a writer, that's one of the things. You, we don't always question why we're writing. I think in my case, I never intended to be a writer. I I did it because I was watching a soap opera one day, and I said, I can write as good as this crap. And, <laughs> and I literally started writing uh, for that reason. Okay. So, you know, I don't know that I found my passion. <laughs> I probably wasn't until years later, you know, until years later that I found a passion. And yeah. like doing radio, I never set out to do radio. That was nothing that was even in the cards um, but I find out that I'm very passionate about it now, and I think Jan can yep. adhere to that, that yeah. I'm very passionate yeah, about. He, he does radio 32 hours a day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. And understand that your passion should be spread. Does anyone want to comment on that? Well, I think with social media, I've started to do that a couple <laughs> of years ago with YouTube channels and uh, sending out videos through my newsletter on drcarmen.com. And I give one minute reminders because people's attention span is shorter mm, these exactly. days, as anyone can attest. So I try to do one minute of how wonderful you are, how precious you are, because we don't hear that enough. Uh, sometimes we didn't grow up with it. And so I send you something to get you thinking in the process of healing. So, um, yeah, so spreading, spreading the word is, and spreading the passion, spreading every, all the ideas that are in our books mm-hmm. is very important because a lot of times they don't read. And they may not hear about your book, maybe through a video, because right. people do watch a video rather right. than pick up a book these days, unfortunately. Right. But the video yep. maybe can steer them to the direction of the book. Well, I'm actually going to do exactly what you just said. For my new book coming out, I've already started working on it. I'm actually creating a video for the book. It's mm-hmm. a two-minute trailer nice. to introduce people to. It's a visual, and then it has a little music underneath it, and then it's, you know, written word nice. that explains what this book's about. So, uh-huh. you know, I, that is, you that do is have good. to find ways yeah. of spreading the word mm-hmm. about what you're doing. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, and find a platform to share your passion. And that's exactly what you're both are doing right now. You're on yeah. the radio sharing your passion. 
And, Doctor, I actually went onto your website and watched several of your videos before we met today. Oh, my. Oh, yeah, that's I, nice. I bought your book on Kindle. I'm going to read it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm very interested in it. I hope someday we can meet. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, that's, sure. a, that's interesting you say that because it says connect with the others who share your passion. <laughs> exactly. That's great. And that's what we get to do every time we do this radio mm-hmm. show because we interact with people who are writers. And we have writers who do everything mm-hmm. from magazines uh-huh. to newspapers. We're getting ready to interview the um, editor in chief at the Review RJ. Journal. I mean, you know, so wow. we really get to meet with everyone from every walk of life when it comes to writing. Mm-hmm. And that's what's really cool. Learn Absolutely. how to get your writing noticed, which. We mm. just basically just talk about that. That's right. And I did a book signing downtown Las Vegas oh, that's at right. Writer's yeah. Block, and that's how we, we met. met. And so, yeah, just oh. thinking uh, of yeah, all, that's yeah, nice. all yeah. kinds yeah. of creative ways to yeah. do that. And you know what? That's the, the power of this, too, is that it's important to go out there and let people know you because you don't know who you're going to run that's into. Right. You know? That's right. right. I need, that, that's how I yeah. met you to mm-hmm. be on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I meet a lot of people that way. Yeah. And you, you'll always find, it's called networking too. You'll always find people who you think that you might not run into that can help you out in some way. So, you know, yeah. Yes. And that's part yep. of what the next one is, was is build a community. <laughs> <laughs> Now, maybe I let me say a few words about networking because that used to be a really scary word for yeah. me because I'm really shy, I think. Um, people don't know that I about don't think me, you are. right? Yeah. I, I because I talk and I do videos, but um, networking. I, I remember Dr. Phil said something that I could really relate to. He said, "I'd rather speak in front of a stadium full of people than be at a cocktail party." I'm exactly I'm like in, that. I am so yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's true. Is it? Does, can you guys relate? I, to I that? can't even stay too long when I go because it's like, I, I know I can't yes, do this. But same here. We're on the radio. I can we go are. and meet a crowd. Yes, yeah. I'm yeah. the same way. So. So do you have any tips, any of you guys, on how to be a better networker? Well, I'm going to tell you this. This is what I do because I'm exactly like that. I really dread going to a party until I get there. And then I tell myself, you have to do this. You have to make a presence. First of all, it's a way of thanking the person that invited you. Mm -hmm. And you really want to show them the respect that they deserve for, you know, having, it's an honor that they invited you. Mm -hmm. So you, I tell myself that that's how I psych myself into going in. And then if I, if I'm standing there and I don't know someone, I'll try and find someone I know. If I don't Uh know someone, I'll find someone else just like me standing in a corner, not talking to someone. And I'll go, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. And that breaks the ice because now when two people get together, Mm -hmm. another person may say, well, I wonder what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's how I do it. Okay. And then sometimes I find I actually had a good time. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) You know, and I stayed the whole party. So, yeah. I always pretend it's a surprise party for me. (laughs) Oh, that's good. That's good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So then I just introduce myself to everybody. Wow. I (laughs) like that. All right. Well, help your community with what you have learned. And you both are doing that. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that you're doing that. And I hope we do that with the show, too. You know, I I admire Dr. Cummins' work. I absolutely do. Oh, bless him. Just couldn't do it. Thank you. All right. Show your community how to spread their own passions. And I think you do that as well. Yeah. What and write and repeat. I think what that means is if you can find a a pleasure in what you're doing or a way of spreading, um, a way of helping yourselves, repeat it. You know, it's kind of like a publisher. A publisher doesn't want you if you don't have another book in the works. Mm. You know, a, a traditional publisher says, well, that's great, but they're going to want something else from you. Mm. So we need to know what your second book is or what you're working on. Mm. So write and repeat. All right, Jen. Okay. Robert Hammond, an award-winning screenwriter and author of over a dozen books, offers seven secrets to writing stories that change lives. Every word has a meaning. Each action or plot twist in the story should also convey some kind of nuance. This is to say that every element has to have some kind of, isn't to say that every element has to have some kind of profound life-changing event, but consider the concept of uh, parables 
and hidden meanings. Um, and that's why I write the way I do. Every pancake has two sides. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it is important to... You have to find the story, the nuance of, of what you're writing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, even though I write fictional stories, um, Jan, yours is fictional. Yeah. Judy, yours is fictional, but it's based on true true life. And then yep. yours is, is a reality book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you still have to convey what that story is about. You can't just put words on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to make sense. It has to be a story that people are going to understand. In reading a book like yours, Dr. Smith, it still has to mm -hmm. – to come across to, to the reader, you know, mm -hmm. convey to the reader what you're trying to get, the point is you're trying to get across. Absolutely. And when you're talking about having someone look, really look at their life when they've been avoiding stuff and distraction and work and career and family and not really uh -huh. looking at themselves, you really have to think of creative ways in order for them to look at. So what I did in the book, The I Am Solution, is every chapter is connected to a video, Every chapter has an exercise that you can do, and every chapter you can write in a journal. If you're a journal writer, you don't have to do it if you're not. But if you are, there's an exercise that you can do regarding journaling. So uh -huh. I'm engaging them to have an action around self-help rather than just Good. reading it. And then it stays on an intellectual level. And I know people that can quote Deepak Chopra, Dr. Wayne Dyer, but they still haven't worked on themselves. Ah. They can lecture you on Marianne Williamson, and they could tell you all of these wonderful quotes, but they right. haven't dug into their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, um, the road. That's right. So in my book, uh, I'm just really creative. I'm trying to get people to either journal, uh, give them an exercise, look at a video, uh, read one chapter, and there's another video that you can go to on YouTube. Now, so, I want to ask you, mm -hmm. on, in your book, we've mm -hmm. talked about this before. We actually had someone on the show just before this one mm -hmm. who actually gave us this idea a couple years ago, three years ago. Um, in your book, do you have QR codes? Because you, your videos go along with what you're writing. Right. Do you have QR codes? I do not have QR codes, but there's a channel that they can go to, and all the videos are there based on the chapter. But what you might think about doing in mm -hmm. that book mm -hmm. is when you have a specific topic you're talking mm -hmm. about that relates to a specific video on YouTube, you can actually create a QR code and put that in that book. So all someone has to do is scan it on scan their smartphone their and then go straight to that video and Sounds see it. Sounds excellent. Yeah. Right. And we, we share right. that with everyone who has yeah. something like like yours because uh -huh. we had a gentleman on last week um it's called the grand gypsy and oh, yeah. i met him yes. yeah he's so nice yes and they're gonna be back on our show too oh, good. and he he's gonna probably do the same thing because mm -hmm. he's got 170 photographs in oh, there yes. that tell a story yes. and you know a lot of this is in video from what his grandfather did and what he's done mm -hmm. so he could actually put that in his book so yeah. you know and and i have to say lance um uh, Talbot is the one who actually gave us this idea. He wrote a book called On Two Fronts. Mm -hmm. And when they were on our show, they shared with us that's what they did throughout the entire book. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool. Yeah, really that is. they actually that's did. Cool. So we got to give him credit for that because yes. I had not heard of it until wow. that. You know? So but it's a great idea because when you're reading a story, you're trying to visualize yes. it. But wouldn't it be great if you're telling the story, you can – Click a little code on on your smartphone yes. and see exactly what they were talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I would have to get somebody who doesn't speak Boston. <laughs> <laughs> we don't pronounce our eyes. Nobody understands what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carmen. Um, the secret of meaning. So think about ways to add new levels of content to your writing. What is your story or book really about on its deepest level? What are the deeper meanings that your writing can convey through the stories you write? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you, I go pretty deep. I mean, I, I go as <laughs> yeah. deep as it gets. Um, uh, so, yeah, and I appreciate people that can go on a deep level because I, I tend to do that. Yeah. And Judy? Uh, the Secret of Legend. Joseph Campbell, author of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, popularized the storytelling concept known as the hero's journey. How can you create a larger-than-life legend in your own writing? Who is your hero? Yeah, and I think that's important. Um, yeah. I, this is so interesting. I've thought of this a million times. I mean, 
God is my hero. That's it. Right. I don't I don't deify anybody in this life. I mean, I adore some people, yeah. and I, I take you know great uh, learning from them, but I don't deify anyone but God. Yeah. So that that's worked for me. Well, sometimes it's kind of like faith. You know, some people. Yeah. You know, my take on faith is a little different than a lot of people's, but I believe everybody, if you, if, if faith is what you need to get you through, then you should definitely, you know, believe in something. You have to, because that's what yep. gets us through life. Yep. So I guess that's yep. kind of what they're saying in that finding the hero in your life. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I see it as uh, I am my hero because I've been through so much. Okay. And look at where I am now. I'm on your radio show. I've written a book. <laughs> I've retired from the county, and I came from an abuse and neglect background. My yeah. father was an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am my hero. When you look back on your past and you say, how in the heck did I get through that? Yeah. How did I survive yeah. that with my sanity? Yeah. How did I get through this and, and be blessed with, you know, maybe money in the bank or whatever you yeah. you you have your health yeah, yeah. or whatever, you know, then, then aren't you the hero? And yes, God has a big part in that, but you know, I just, I get a kick out of me. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, I like that. I, I really like that in that. And, uh, yeah. I mean, so the, I, I don't I, think there's anything wrong with having a hero mm -hmm. in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who I would think of as heroines, Mostly heroines because uh, I'm very woman focused. It was me and my four little sisters, you know, kind of against everybody and everything. But um, in, when we grew up, so that uh, they are heroes to me, but they wouldn't own that in their own life, you know. So we kind of just adore each other um, and not call each other heroes. But I guess it would have to be them and my mother. Yeah. You know? Well, my mother, yeah. I I always hate to do this part of the show because we're running out of, uh, running out of time. No, not again. <laughs> yeah, and we have a lot we hadn't covered that we were going to cover today. But anyway, this is this is down. We're down to the last minute of the show, and I would like to thank our guests, Dr. Carmen Smith and Judy Shine Logan, along with my co-host Janet. Corsi. And Carmen, where, again, can we learn more about your, your work? Well, all you have to do is Google me, thank goodness, as Dr. <laughs> Carmen Smith. Um, or you can go to my website, drcarmen.com. You can go to my YouTube channel, Dr. Carmen Smith, on YouTube. And also, um, you can also email me. If you have any questions right now after the show or whatever, let me give you um, my email address. It's K-A-R-L-C-S-W at gmail.com. That's K-A-R-L-C-S-W at gmail.com. Thank you. We're glad you did that. Is that V as in Victor? Um, uh, let's see. K-A-R-L-C-S-W. Okay. At gmail.com. Email.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And Judy, where can we learn more about your work? My work is, as I say, it's been on hold for a while, um, but I'm getting back into it. My website is pretty stagnant. And I haven't done anything with it in the last year, but it's judyshinelogan.com. And, again, I'm going to be getting back on there and getting my life back in order. So some uh, major stuff going on, but, you know, I'll manage to do that. Okay. And Judy's book is Shelter Me When Friendship is All That Remains. And I recommend Thanks, everybody read it. I, I loved it, and it has saved a, a friend of mine's life. I know. All right. Well, I'm going to have to do this here, or we're going to run out of time here. Uh, you can find the video of our past shows at youtube.com forward slash aspects of writing. Aspects of writing is all one word. Or you can go to our website, aspectsofwriting.com. There you will find links to our syndicated show on iHeartRadio. And also on Roku TV, amfm247.com, and 14 terrestrial stations. In addition, we archive all of our shows on the Aspects of Writing website. Until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Great show, guys. Thank you.